Salam alaikum and welcome to yet another episode of Karbala Reflections. Today we will be discussing staying silent in the face of oppression and injustice and the effects it has not only on us as individuals and the people we surround ourselves with but also the community as a whole. I'm joined today with Dr. Kate and Sister Maryam. Thank you so much today for joining us to discuss this very relevant topic. So on the day of Ashura, obviously we're always reading about the numbers, an army of 30,000 against an army of no more than 70 something. Did every person in that large army participate? Did they all play a part in the crimes that took place? Well, as far as we know, and as far as hadith that we have received, as far as I've heard, no, not every single one of them participated. Why would they need anyway 30,000 people against 72 people? So, no, not really. And actually, um, there's the story of this uh, man who um, met the Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam sometime after the um, Waqat Ashura. When uh, the Imam was doing the tawaf near the Kaaba, and he came to the Imam and he asked him, to ask God for forgiveness for him because he said I was there on the day of Ashura but I did nothing I didn't even move a stone meaning that I didn't throw anything I didn't even like I didn't even uh, try to um, do anything with the sword I didn't do anything he didn't even sharpen he didn't even sharp a sword for someone else nothing Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he said, he was, he was like a bystander, really. Yeah. He, so he's like, and he said, but I was there. So please ask God for forgiveness. And we have it that the Imam, not just he, not only he didn't ask for forgiveness for this guy, but he took his hands up and he actually started doing dua that uh, God let him go to hell, let him go to hell, let him go to hell. And the guy was so astonished, like, why? I ask you for forgiveness and you're saying that. So the Imam answers a phrase which is in Arabic, كثرت السواد. You you made the blackness of that day even more and the translation of that so the imam not only says that just being silent and standing there on like on that day is not good enough but he's telling him the reason because when you do that because for the family of Ahlul Bayt when they are looking at that army when the kids of Imam Hussein the children the women when they see that army just being there just having that extra blackness there that extra figure it just makes them even more frightened maybe like oh all of these people are against us and that's for the Ahlul Bayt that had a very very strong faith of course it's just that they might be the kids at least they might be more frightened but like the, the way I see it, it's like in our society today, if there are people who are not sure about what they are doing, they, they know it's right, but they are not that sure. They are a little bit weak in their heart. When they see the numbers on the other side are bigger, even if it's just standing silent there, even if you're doing nothing, but just seeing that number, they get affected. I'm like, oh, that's the majority. I have to be with the majority. And it has a big effect. So yeah, not all people fought that day, even, but Regardless, even if you were there on that day and you were silent, you will be punished for it. So there was consequences for his actions that for me is quite interesting Mm. because he couldn't even have predicted it. He genuinely thought that the Imam was going to ask for forgiveness Mm. for him. He couldn't see any wrong that he had done. And I guess it just emphasizes even if you're silent, actually your your actions or non-actions count. And... um, just his presence there alone was enough to put fear into the hearts of the Ahlul Bayt or to have an impact. And I think it, if we kind of flip that round and bring it back to today, if as Muslims we're silent on things that are going on around us that are, are wrong or oppressive, it's not enough just to perhaps dislike it in our hearts. We have to be active. And it actually, as you were speaking, it reminds me of the Hadith that if we see a, a wrong, we have to change it with our hand. If we can't do that, we have to hate it or change it with our hearts. Or oh, sorry, with our with our tongue, and if not, then with our heart, and that is the the, the weakest of faith. Yeah. Um, but that's only if we've kind of tried all the other kind of actions first, in a way. Um, so actually, being silent isn't an option. It's your presence counts. Um, so the reason that story really is interesting to me is because trying to put myself in his position, which I hope I would never be, but he genuinely thought he was doing enough by not doing anything. Some people are just perhaps not brave enough or couldn't see the consequences of their actions when they're thinking about it. So I think that's a position that we can easily find ourselves in. What would you say to someone who would find themselves in a position like that? 
the thing is it's not always about not brave enough or not like what like the actions and the army of wrong that is happening today that we really shouldn't be part of it i don't think a lot of it it doesn't need to be brave or anything i mean dr kate would know no sometimes like in her situation you have to be brave and you have to take a stand but like in my situation as somebody sitting on the internet by just clicking on some links and just having that count up it's, when it's a wrong film to watch let it be violence let it be like really not islamic stuff or again by me just clicking that click i don't need to be brave not to click that click you know but just me doing that and adding to their count and just saying oh like 30,000 people viewed it or 40,000 it's just me being part of that bad army that is standing over there and I just need to think about my actions like when I'm even I don't know even sometimes crossing the road sometimes I have to think am I part of that army that is like doing the wrong will my click on the internet sometimes or just passing or you know with WhatsApp and all of the just passing messages like you get a video you just pass it and you don't know what it is you don't need to be brave I think you just sometimes need to think before you do anything and just don't follow the majority because like everyone swearing you know as Muslims mm -hmm. which is women we're so visible as Muslims exactly. we represent Islam when we go out you know if, if you if you swear or you shout or you push past somebody in the street, then we're bringing kind of bad reputation to Islam exactly. as well. So yeah. I think it's a really interesting point you made actually about the, the clicking on the internet mm. and e equally valid. Um, I think I think sometimes, like you were saying, of just being a, a, a very clear representative of Islam on the street, we might, going to your swearing, we might swear in the presence of ourselves mm -hmm. and we might think that no one has heard it. But the, the what's been interesting for me is that we don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't know who is analyzing your actions. You don't know if someone overheard you from somewhere else. You don't know even if you were in the presence of a very close family member, if someone would hear about what you've done. Mm -hmm. And in Islam, we I, I believe, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a very big emphasis put on our actions and not just what it leads to, for example, an action that I did that only involves you and me, but also, for example, a third party who watched this, witnessed this, and perhaps learned something from this. I'm held accountable for that, mm. am I not? Yeah, C completely. And I think we have no way of knowing the impact our actions mm. or non-actions are going to have. So in the case, if we see somebody being attacked on the street, if we choose to remain silent and not get involved for fear of, of whatever, um, that's not only going to have an impact on perhaps a person being attacked, it's also going to have an impact on the people around that observed us walking past or not doing anything. And conversely, if we actually do step in and try and help, that's going to have a more positive. People are going to say, actually, God, they're Muslim, they're stepping in to kind of try and right the wrong. And actually, that's also going to have an impact on people that are around. We have no way of knowing what our actions and non-actions, you know, the ripple effects of that. Only Allah knows that. And that's why... We can't be afraid to stand up and speak the truth. Um, this is something that you know I'm so passionate about. We have to speak the truth. You know, and people say, oh, but you might lose your job or you might go to prison or this and that. If we really embody the message of Imam Hussein and, and kind of Ashura and Kabbalah, we can't be afraid of that. You know, we have to know we're doing this for Allah. We have to speak the truth um, when all this is going around. If I lose my job, then that's Allah's will, but he knows the reason why we've spoken the truth or whatever. We're never going to be made to lose if we take a stance for the truth and do it for a lot, you know, and kind of, you know. That. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. do you think, I mean, have you have you read any ayahs or have you heard any hadiths that show that we are going to be held accountable for what people learn from us, not just the direct result of our actions, but what well, people uh, have learned? You know, I've always heard the stories since I was a little girl that if there's a fire in your neighbor's house and you sit and you say, no, 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 it's OK, it's in my neighbor's house. So let me just leave it and do nothing about it. Eventually, the fire will get to your house as well and you will burn and your house will burn. So you cannot just stay silent when there's a fire somewhere else. But uh, very inter interestingly, uh, I heard this um, uh, this story about uh, a person coming to the imam and asking him and he's saying you know all of these stories in the quran about qawm lut qawm nabi saleh different stories about when the punishment from god comes uh, the good people are separated and they are always saved and the bad people they get punished but again we have another verse in the quran which says uh, it's like i'm not 
like it's not 100% sure of the pronunciation of all of it but it means وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً which means uh, be careful, be aware, be pre- like of a fitna. A fitna it means something bad that comes that it won't just affect the good or uh, it won't just affect the bad of you or the people who did uh, injustice uh, but it will like be it will involve everyone so that person asks the imam and he says like what is this like why sometimes god like separates the good and the bad and some fitness when they come they mm-hmm. like they take everyone and the imam says this is when the people the good people in society stay silent when they see the wrong so in the other situations the good people the prophets they they took a stand, they spoke against it, they did something about it, and they weren't part of that um, fitna that they came or the adab that came. But in this situation, people stayed silent. Even the good, they were against it, they didn't like it, but they were silent. And when you stay silent, the Imam explains, this is when it comes and it takes all of you all together. Mm -hmm. So staying silent, for that specific individual is not good for him because the imam does dua for him to go to hell. And as a society, it's not good because it means you will be part of that punishment that comes to the entire society. I think the point she made about um, just clicking on a link or watching a video one extra time was really, really interesting, very eye-opening. Yeah. Are there any other examples that you can think of in our daily lives or perhaps yours that require us to not stay silent and why um yeah and, and really interesting what sister said um but i suppose thinking in terms of kind of some work i'm doing and actually directly related to muharram as well because it was during muharram of last year that i mm-hmm. became aware of the government's move to introduce um, relationship and sex education as compulsory into all primary and secondary schools okay. and i was really shocked by this Um, So I started looking into it and kind of researching into what's happening, which is actually deeply shocking and deeply dangerous. And actually a lot of the teachings they want to introduce go against everything that Islam teaches. Um, So I thought, my God, I've really got to kind of speak out about this. And it was actually, again, I think really poignant that it happened during Muharram because it's the message of Imam Hussain, alayhi salam, is to speak the truth, to take a stance and speak out against the wrongs that are going on. And for me, it just felt so relevant because, you know, if we don't speak out about kind of whether it's different sexual ideologies that are going to be taught to our children, different practices that go against everything as Muslims we we know to be true and kind of valid, then we're going to lose our youth to kind of to kind of these kind of deviations that are going on in society. Um, so I felt that I had to kind of again take a stand, speak out, and it was purely kind of through kind of embodying, if you like, the message of, of Imam Hussein that kind of gave me the courage, obviously with a lot of <laughs> prayers and du'as as well. Um, and having to speak out about this, because if if we don't speak out about the harams and the forbidden things going on in society, then we're complicit in allowing it to kind of to happen in a way. Um, and so I've had to speak out about certain sexual orientations that as Muslims we don't agree with and whilst in in this country under British law people do have the right to practice and believe what they want that doesn't mean as Muslims that we just have to lie down and accept it we have to speak our tr- the truth um, and that's what Imam Hussein Lay Salam would want that's what Allah expects from us that's what Imam Mehdi is waiting for um, because by being silent, whether it's a community, whether it's the leaders actually it's it's just kind of giving the message that these things are, can, can go ahead. And I think particularly the leaders have to speak out on things, um, whether it's kind of LGBT or things, again, not about persecuting, we have to be tolerant to people in this country, absolutely, but we have to speak our Islamic truth and say for our community what is right and what is wrong. I mean, your stand is very impressive. Did at any time, um, did you worry about the repercussions you might face for deciding to pursue this cause? I mean, <laughs> I kind of thought it through quickly. I, my brain works quite quickly and I know the repercussions are that I've already had quite um, a lot of uh, onslaught. I've lost friendships over it. Um, and obviously my I work in schools so I could lose my job, whatever. But to be honest, it really doesn't worry me whatever the repercussions are in this life because you know, Imam Hussein wasn't worrying about his life when he was standing on the fields of Karbala. You know, all his children were sacrificed as well. We can't, if we're really Muslims, 
true Muslims and we embody that message, we can't worry about what's going to happen to us in this life. Because if I'm doing this for Allah or we're doing this for Allah, then Allah's got our back. You know, it doesn't matter if I lose that job, Allah will bring something else into my life to help me pay my rent or whatever. Um, you know, whatever it happens, whatever happens, we're doing this for for Allah and for the, the the truth. Then we can't be worried about our attachments um, in this world. And just somebody like Sheikh Zakzaki, I think about a lot as well. You know, he stood for the truth, and you know, like all his sons have been killed. He's in prison. You know, these these are the people we need to aspire to be like to speak the truth, regardless of what happens to us in this life. This life is temporary. We've got to aim for the ultimate goal, which is is heaven, inshallah. Picking up from a point she made um, about the repercussions, I can see that as perhaps one of the main reasons that people sometimes choose to remain silent in the face of oppression, which is what we're talking about today. However, I think another thing that comes to mind is that people sometimes think their actions won't matter a lot. It won't really make a big difference. And so they think it's not worth it. What's your opinion on that? Well. I think the more advanced technology gets in the day that we live in, the more effect our actions actions have, especially in this world, day by day, hour by hour, our actions. You know, we're getting into a smaller and smaller world. Everything is connected. So definitely my actions, what I do, will have an effect on others, be it good or be it bad. We cannot just, I think, just saying that, no, my actions won't have an effect. It's just trying to convince myself not to do anything. It's just the lazy way out of it. Because definitely my actions have. And um, small actions all added together that can have an effect. Just one person here, one person there doing this, doing that. And again, I know some actions really need bravery. Really, you have to be strong. You have to be like standing up. Some actions really need nothing. Just need you to fight your nafs, fight your what you want that that like that pleasure that you want to have in this very, very small, temporary very temporary leisure that you just want to have it in this mini in this second you know it's not something fighting up and standing i mean i definitely agree with dr kate that there are some stuff happening now in the society that we all need to have a stand and that stand might be a little bit like harder but there are small stuff that we can start with ourselves and our families, very, very small stuff that we can do that really just needs to me to stand up to my own self. No, no one else. No one else. Jihad, isn't there? Exactly. One. Yeah, Actually, jihad and exactly. the ego is, exactly. is the greatest. Exactly. Yeah, and something. it will have an effect. If me as a mother mm. stand up for something, even if it's my in myself, it will have an indirect effect. Even if it's not on no one else in the house, it's on my own kids. It will have an effect. And definitely it will have an effect on the on the later life so which is the ultimate effect i mean personally um i i i agree with you that we do live in a very small world our actions definitely affect people but what helps me personally when i'm trying to stand up against injustice um which obviously does happen on a regular basis even if it's in very small doses i think to myself that allah is watching Mm -hmm. and even if no one else is learning anything from me even if it really doesn't make a difference which i'm sure it does but if i in that in this particular time cannot see the difference the faith that allah is watching and that 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 in itself is enough right yeah and i I also think we have no way of knowing how allah is going to judge our actions or the impact so you know somebody standing out speaking out about injustice on a big platform people may assume that that's a, a, a bigger good deed than you know a mother at home just trying to get her children off the internet or you know whatever yeah. nobody's to say that actually the mother at home doing something halal and forbidding the crime with her child is that maybe that's going to have a greater impact or Allah is going to actually give more weight to that good deed than somebody on a big platform mm-hmm. only Allah knows what's in the hearts so Imam Hussein's message was so it has been so universal that subhanallah it's affected all of us personally, especially you, with um, with where it led you to lead your work to, with the mm-hmm. Muharram um, activities that you were participating in last year. However, Imam Hussein paid the ultimate sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Imam Hussein sacrificed his life, his family's life, his kids, his sisters, the women mm-hmm. that were there. You know, he the absolute ultimate sacrifice and for for the greater good, for the sake of the faith that he had. Of course, 
it wasn't easy mm-hmm. you know watching your your six month old baby die in your arms it's not easy but he was willing to do that mm-hmm. thankfully we haven't found ourselves in a position well at least so far in our mm-hmm. lives to pay that ultimate sacrifice and yet we struggle with the small sacrifices mm-hmm. in life yeah and i think it's exactly what you said imam hussein was prepared to give everything Um, And a lot of us here in the West struggle to give up sugar and tea. Do you know what I mean? We all have our attachments, but it's for me, it's about resetting our compass. What what does it mean to be a Muslim? What does it mean to be a follower of the Ahlul Bayt? And when you you understand that this life is temporary, actually, it's the next life is the goal. That is is the reality, if you like, then actually whether we lose um, small things or bigger things, it's kind of you know inconsequential in a way because if we if we're true if we call ourselves Shia if we really know what that means then we would kind of put up with having to lose whatever lose whatever we need to in this life. It's easy to say that, and obviously when it comes to to it that that's another thing. But even if we lose our job or our position or our visa or whatever, if we know that that is purely a consequence of standing for the truth or believing in you know following what we believe. We will never be in loss, and I think this is what people have to, in a way, desecularize themselves and and look at kind of they become too comfortable in the materialistic lifestyles here. If we're, we're true to what we say we are, and we truly do kind of embody the spirit of Muharram, so be it. Whatever we lose, and and obviously everybody's different, everybody's situations are different, and it, it's not com- about comparing that person's lost more than me, therefore they're better. No, it's you know everything's relevant to the individual, and Allah will test us individually. Um, but we have to whatever we lose in this life, we haven't lost. It's actually an honor and a blessing to actually lose things in this life for the sake of Islam and the sake of speaking the truth. Um, whatever work we do, we have to. I pray, I make dua for this because, you know, I want to kind of get as far as I can, inshallah, in the next life. And actually, it's an honor to to kind of follow in the footsteps of Imam Hussein for any of us in whichever small way we can. And I think it's, that's what people, it's the small things, the small changes are maybe in the eyes of Allah, big changes. So whether it's just speaking out any injustice, whether it's in the street, in the school, in society, in any way you can, that's what's important. And only Allah knows how much courage it takes that individual person to do a certain thing. Um, so it's we mustn't get into the habit of comparing what we're doing with others. That's that's irrelevant in the sight of Allah. So the story, um, this this very moving story that I heard when I was a kid, was that there was a forest, and the forest um, there was a forest fire, and the fire was getting bigger and bigger, and all the birds. Um, they, they flew away and they left and relating it to our topic of staying silent against injustice obviously the birds can't speak but they can act against injustice and so they, they all flew away except this one bird and he kept going and coming going and coming bringing a tiny amount of water that he could carry in his beak and dumping it on the fire and the fire was getting bigger and bigger and he was bringing a very limited amount the other birds came to him and said, what are you doing? You know, you're not going to be able to stop this fire, to extinguish this fire. And he said, well, maybe I can and maybe I can't. But that's not the point. The point is I have to do what's right yeah. mm-hmm. and I will try. And maybe my beak is not strong enough to carry all the water that's mm-hmm. needed. But had we all worked together and had we all done what was right, it would have definitely extinguished this fire and we could live here. And we could remain happy here. Mm. So the the story is, I feel like it might be so simple, but really that's the problem we are facing now in the problems and the the, the things that are holding us back from standing up against injustice. Why do you think that standing, not standing against injustice could be harmful? This force could have burned down the whole world, perhaps, maybe. What, what about the examples and, and the things we are going through currently? Yeah, so I remember growing up as a kid in Iraq and I remember my dad was in prison because he did take a stand against Saddam. And people would come to me and like, your dad is crazy, your dad is crazy. Very like, and they some of them were very like near family. Like, why my dad is crazy? And they said, because you know, when you see a hungry lion, you don't go and stand in front of him and like, no, no, he will eat you. Of course you have to be like, you go and hide. 
And I really didn't get it at the time. And once I asked my mom, like, what, and my mom said, no, but if everybody stood in front of that lion, maybe they can capture that lion. And it, actually, that's what happened. They didn't take a stand, and they made fun of people who, made, who took a stand. But it ended up in most of their kids themselves losing their lives. They were gotten, they were imprisoned. A lot of them were executed. They lost their homes. They lost their jobs. They lost a lot of people lost a lot by just staying silent. Maybe if that three, four people, maybe more thousands, would stand up, many more people would stay alive today. They would still have their like houses, their businesses, their, and they would have the next world as well. So you can lose by just staying silent. You can definitely lose. That's what I saw when I was growing up. And I mean, in current affairs, what's going on right now, we really stand to lose a lot if we don't, for example, stand up for the women who choose to wear the niqab. Mm. Let's keep aside the argument of whether it is Islamically required mm. or not. However, for the women who do choose to wear it, mm. we, we, we... It's their right to wear it. You know, it should be their right to wear it. And it's, you know, these men sitting in offices deciding what women or wi women can or cannot wear. And it's um, absolutely, and if, yeah, whether it's Islamic practice or not, like you said, we're not here to discuss that. But if we don't stand up for the rights of women to kind of, to wear the burqa or the niqab, then when they push that through, they ban it in this country as they have in many other European countries, then they're gonna target the hijab. And you know, there are some places that already um, you know, trying to kind of get rid of that. We know that that's their long-term agenda. It's a step um, at a time, isn't it? Absolutely, and the, with the whole kind of, I call it the turbanization of the hijab. Right. You know, we're noticing a lot of Muslim women now wearing turbans instead of the proper hijab. And this is their kind of social engineering, if you like, of the new Muslim that's acceptable to the West. So we have to take a stance on women's right to wear the burqa or whatever, because if we don't, we'll end up, we'll lose not only in this world, we'll lose in the next world. I think I think sometimes, um, as you said, we have to stand up. And some cases now, I think this this day it's much easier sometimes to stand up mm -hmm. for stuff. Uh, we've seen on the news a few days ago the, this girl uh, who basically won the case because uh, she was prosecuted for what was it? Um, uh, are you talking about the lady who refused to shake hands at yes. the immigration yeah, interview? Yeah, yeah, and basically she won her case. So mm -hmm. sometimes maybe more and more people taking a stand. I think if you do through the legal channels and if you know and you have the support, you can easily win. It doesn't mm -hmm. always mean that you will sacrifice. Sometimes you can have it both. You can have it in this world and the, in, in the next world. It's just that you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know sometimes, yes, you have to sacrifice, but sometimes no, there's no sacrifice. It's just that you have to like yeah. say something. And it inspires other people to exactly. do it now. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I have just learned so much uh, from the both of you and the great examples you've given both from the past and the issues that we are facing today. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on another episode of Karbala Reflections. Today's episode covering the costs of remaining silent in the face of oppression and injustice has shed some light on this topic that affects us all. Thank you so much and Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs>